Good morning and welcome once again to worship with Philadelphia Taylor and Unity United Methodist Churches. Thank you for inviting us into your homes or wherever you are viewing this and know that our prayers are with you and for you each week. Before we uh, begin worship this morning, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today celebrating the baptism of your son is another way that you revealed him to the world and Lord through that baptism we claim his name Christian Lord I pray that for each one of us that you will help us to lead a life that more reflects you and the joys and the good plans that you have made for us Lord if we if we have failed you this week, I pray that you forgive us. Being a human as we are, Lord, I know that we have failed. I pray that you forgive us for those times that we fail you, for those times that we accidentally fail you, and for those times when we intentionally fail. Lord, strengthen us, guide and direct our steps so that they may be more in line with yours. I lift up each person who hears this message and pray that you guide and protect them, keep them well, and protect their families and their friends. Lord, I pray that this Omicron variant of the COVID virus makes as many people possible as, as, as possible immune to it, but I pray that this is the end of the COVID crisis. Lord, for those who have it right now, I pray that you strengthen their bodies and make their bodies resistant to this virus. I lift up our, our churches to you. I pray for guidance for all of our church's leaders. May they be strong in their faith and ever able to help direct those who are in their flock. And Lord, I pray that our leaders of our country and our communities and our churches humble themselves before you and pray for your guidance and direction before they make any decisions that affect our lives. I pray this prayer and we join together in the model prayer Jesus taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our Old Testament reading is from the prophet Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 3. But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Our New Testament reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Our gospel text this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 and 21 through 22. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. 
When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and may only your words be spoken and heard today. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Well, you know, in the famous play by William Shakespeare, Juliet said these words, What's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. In that scene, Juliet is referring to the young Romeo and she doesn't understand. She doesn't think that his last name or her last name makes any difference. To the two of them, it doesn't. But you know, that isn't always the case. It may be that the young girl was wrong. Sometimes roses by any other name might not smell as sweet. Just ask Essie Mae Washington Williams, or should I say Essie Mae Thurmond. Her father was the North Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond, who in his teenage years fathered a young Essie Mae by his parents black maid. And his stance in Congress was a very strict line of racial segregation. When Essie Mae um, at last announced who she was, she said, I at last feel completely free. You see, she said these words after she became a retired California school teacher, when she revealed her family secret. You see, the senator's not so secret secret was well known by many in Washington and North Carolina. And he had maintained a relationship with Essie Mae throughout the years, even though it was, um, he, he, he talked with her regularly, paid for her college, and, but it was distance. It was a distanced relationship. How special it would have been to her to have had her father acknowledge just who she was. Can you imagine that? Cut off from your family for whatever reason, denied recognition of your rightful identity, Miss Washington Williams told the press this, there's a great sense of peace that has come over me in the past year. Once I decided that I would no longer harbor such a great secret that many others knew, I feel as though a tremendous weight has been lifted. Even in the absence of parental acknowledgement or her father standing there beside her, as she announced who she was, even in that, in that moment, she felt this exhilaration and this liberation through expressing her identity and publicly claiming it. What brings that to mind this morning is the story of Jesus's baptism. And as he stands in the River Jordan and other people are standing around, the voice of God acknowledges him. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. God publicly announced that family tie that day. And for us, that's what baptism is. Baptism is the same thing. It's the public announcement of our being claimed by God. 
either we as adults or as infants in our parents' arms come to the water and we are named as God's own. Name, of course, is more than just um, a means of identification. When we name our children, we try to pick out a special name that reflects something. Maybe it's a family member that we particularly admire or someone that we admired growing up. But there's something about the name that expresses, expresses certain characteristics and traits, good qualities that we hope our children exhibit as they grow up. On the other side of that coin, we avoid names for our children that would be negative on them. I don't know of anyone who's named their sons Benedict Arnold or Judas, nor do I know anyone who's named a daughter Jezebel. We just don't pick those names because we want their names to reflect their character. Names aren't chosen willy-nilly. We don't just put a piece of paper in a hat unless we can't decide, unless we've got several that we can't decide from, then we might be put those in a hat. But some choice goes into those names. They reflect our hopes and our dreams for the potential character and abilities of our children. Has anyone ever damaged your name, sullied your reputation? Well, I don't guess they could really damage your name by erasing any letters or anything like that, scratch through paper, but you know that it can be done. Usually we end up doing it to ourselves. Think of Pete Rose, that fantastic baseball player who was pulled from the Baseball Hall of Fame because he became so overcome with wanting wealth that he did something baseball players are never supposed to do. He bet on baseball games, sometimes even on his own. He would have been one of the best players ever and that would have been his legacy. But instead, what he did to be pulled from the ranks of the uh, highly favored baseball players, sullied his name and he has, he's been living with the consequences from that ever since. The reverse is also true. Have you ever made a name for yourself or know someone who has made a name for themselves? Doesn't mean that that name was put on a plaque and set on a desk, but it has to do with reputation. When you make a name for yourself, you acquire a certain prestige and your name, good or bad, means something. It's your reputation. It's your reputation. As you can see, a name even in our society means a great deal. It's more than just distinguishing who a person is so that I don't have to point and say, you, 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 you know. I can look and I can call you by name. And that's what's so important about the name. When I call someone's name and I look at that person there is an esteem that I sense coming back from them. When I ask someone, someone their name, I want to be able to call them by name and get to know them as a person. I want to know their characters and their, and what makes them them, who a person is, character, ability, reputation. What's in a name? Oh, there's a lot in the name, Juliet. In baptism, you are named. In some tradition, a baby is not named until his or her baptism. Baptism also sets each of us apart 
as a particular kind of person, one who is owned by God, one who is called to live out the meaning of this remarkable reality. Certainly, the unbaptized also belong to God. Everybody on this planet belongs to God. But those who have not been baptized since they've had no public opportunity to announce or celebrate that fact, they might not feel the motivation to act on it. Many forces are constantly trying to define us as a member of one family or another. You know, I'd still be a member of the Pontiac family if they made them. It was my favorite car of all time. By default, because that's what David likes, I've become a member of the Ford family. Because, I've mar because I married David, I became a member of the Moore family. Yes. Governments try to make us part of their family. They call us their citizens. We're issued a social security number that, may, that registers us as an American citizen. Our states register us through our driver's license and they also state claim on us through our social security numbers. I'm an Arkansan, a member of the Arkansas family because I'm, I have a residence and I am registered to vote. But baptism sets us apart as in a different family. It's not like those other voices that tell us that we belong only to ourselves and individualism itself is a supreme God. No. That's why a day like today is good for us. A day where we stop and we actually think about and concentrate on baptism, our own baptism, the baptism of Jesus. It's a reminder that we have been named as God's own. And that means everything. It's vital in our walk for discipleship. Yet that means there is work to do, not something that we want to hear in our lives that are already filled with way too much business. Barbara Brown Taylor is a renowned Anglican priest and she wrote this, I will never forget the woman who listened to my speech on the ministry of the laity as God's best hope for the world and said, I'm sorry, but I don't want to be that important. Like many who sit beside her at church, she hears the invitation to ministry as an invitation to do more, to lead, the, to lead a door-to-door -door campaign to bring people to church, to teach in Sunday school, or to be the organizer for vacation Bible school, to cook supper for the homeless. Yeah. Maybe she hears it as a, you need to be more generous or you need to be more loving or you need to be more religious. Anyway, they hear it as you must do more. But that's not necessarily it. God might call you to do more, but she hears the invitation to do more in an already busy world, what she doesn't realize is that she may be called to do what she is already doing with one difference. Namely that when she do, does it, she does it, namely understanding herself to be God's child in and for the world. What you're doing, extending the hand of God to someone else, 
not out of a sense of obligation, but as a sense of God's love flowing through you. It may not call you to do anything differently, but to do it with a different mindset. If anyone thinks that I'm going to come in uh, in a sermon and just verbally whip up on people to make you feel bad and, and beat you up to make you do better, well, that's not the way it works. You're gonna be disappointed my words this morning are to remind you of your heritage and your family ties the ties that were announced for all the world in your baptism just as they were announced in jesus's baptism god is saying just like he said to jesus god is saying you are mine you have been named mine as the water washed over your forehead, and I love you. Yes, God loves you. Martin Luther had a lifelong habit of each morning as he arose, he would make the sign of the cross on his forehead, and he would say, remember, Martin, you are baptized. I encourage you this morning to... Make the sign of the cross on your forehead and say, insert your name and say, remember Carol. Remember Susan. Remember Johnny. You are baptized. I think I've told this story before in another sermon, but it's important to tell again and emphasize a little different aspect of it. Reverend Fred Craddock talked about going on vacation in the Smoky Mountains with his wife and they were um, uh, at a restaurant at a place called the Black Bear Inn. And he said that he and his wife went in and they sat down and intending to have a quiet, cozy lunch. And this man just out of the blue says, well, hey, you're a tourist, aren't you? Well, yes, we are. Well, what do you do? And then Craddock said that he thought to himself, well, it's really none of your business. But he replied, I'm a minister. Oh, this white-haired man, rugged, and uh, just wheeled a chair and said, let me sit down. I've got a preacher story to tell you. Well... He said, I was born back here in these mountains and um, I attended the Laurel Springs Church. You see, my mother wasn't married and back in those days, that wasn't something that people took lightly. And he said, you can imagine how embarrassed I was about that. He said, As I was going, when I go to school, I would go down to the river and hide behind some trees and weeds to eat my lunch rather than eat with the other kids because they could be so very cruel. And when I'd go to town with my mother, I would see people looking at me, just wondering who my daddy was. He said, but the preacher at that Laurel Springs church fascinated me. He fascinated me, but at the same time, he scared me. He had this big beard and a real deep voice and a gruff, rough, rough, Rough hewn, roughly hewn face. And I love to hear that man preach. But he said, when church was over, I would rush to get out of the aisle so I could know that I could get out before everyone else because I knew that a person like me wouldn't be welcome in the church. And that someone might catch me and say, who do you think you are coming to this church? Well, he said, one Sunday I wasn't quick enough and people got in the aisle and I had to wait. And all of a sudden I felt a hand on my shoulder and it scared me to death when I realized it was the preacher. He said, the preacher didn't say a word. He just looked at me and then he said, well, boy, you're a child of, and when he said that, I just totally froze because I knew he was gonna start trying to guess who my daddy was. He said, you're a child of mm, 
yeah, you're a child of God. I see a result. Re I see a remarkable resemblance. And he said, when he did that, he swatted me on the behind and said, go claim your inheritance, boy. You see, and then the old man who was telling the story said to Fred, I was born on that day. That man was the former governor of Tennessee, Ben Hooper. So what's in a name? There's a whole lot in a name for Ben Hooper and S.E. May William, Washington Williams. But there is so much in a name for each one of us. And I'm not take, talking about the name that our birth certificate or our marriage license carries with it. I am talking about the name that we claim Christian. What a name and what a wonder that is. Remember, when we come into church or we gather in this medium and it's cold outside and you can hear the words, you are my son or you are my daughter whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And remember that in your baptism, you are named a child of God. That's where we find strength for the struggle, courage for the crises, and hope for the future. You are a part of God's family. You are God's own child and you are never alone. And nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us receive the benediction. People of hope and peace, go into the world. Bring God's healing love to those you meet. In Jesus' name, go in peace. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.